So now we're going to talk about the second semester of uh, Read Alouds in the second grade. But we're going to begin with one of our collective favorites, The Gardener. So, Tanya, can you maybe outline the story of The Gardener because it may not be familiar to people? Um, so this book is about a little girl who lives in the country in it's in during the Depression era. And she sent her dad's out of work. Her mom doesn't have work. They can't afford her. So they send her to the city to her Uncle Jim to live. And the whole story is told through letters. So it is a different kind of read. But the great thing is it's in full color. It's in full color as there's her, you know, her, the train station when she goes. She's on the train and then she gets to this city. And the whole thing is suddenly black and white. There is no color in the city. And, and she basically goes through. She loves nature and her grandmother has given her seeds to bring with her and she she's got this grumpy uncle who probably did not want a little girl to come and live with him it doesn't say that but it's implied that he's not really his face is always pretty well and he doesn't know what to do with the child yeah and so he she secretly starts planting on the roof this garden that then she surprises him this is his gift and i'm going to let lee talk about because I know you want to talk about his reaction. Um, So why don't you do that? Hello, everyone. Ian here. Thanks so much for joining us on this episode of Novel Thoughts. This show only happens with your support, and that means the world to us. If you don't know already, all the books we talk about on Novel Thoughts are available on our website at memoriapress.com, along with a ton of other great resources for homeschool families looking for great literature for their homes and classrooms. Thanks for being here. Now let's get back to the episode. I think, first of all, this book's really interesting and that there are some details that kind of um, uh, anticipate some of the reading that's coming ahead. For instance, you know, that that, that the child is sent away to live with relatives during um, difficulties within the family. It kind of alludes to Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, which is what happens with the uh, Pevensey children uh, have to, you know, have to go to the country. Um, It it can kind of alludes to Heidi a little bit in, in a, in a, and a little girl living with her grumpy uncle. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I think it also kind of is reminiscent of the Moffats to me, like sort of an urban, like a city environment where, you know, uh, uh, the mother is a dressmaker, just like the Moffats children. And they just, you know, they're sort of scampering around um, a, a city um, and they're kind of going through some, some hardship. I mean, it's the depression era, right? And so you can see some of those similarities and and so, and so you don't necessarily need to talk about what's coming in the future, but it's easy to talk about what has been read by the child. So you can, you know, sort of show the child through repetition that, you know, in hard times, you know, everybody works, the, every, you, 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 the dressmaking or, you, you know, you find opportunities to make things beautiful or to make things fun or, you know, even in unexpected ways, the grumpy uncle can turn mm-hmm. out to be, you know, someone very special to you. And, you know, those kinds of uh, similarities, I think, are interesting to point out. Um, what else do you love about the book? I've got more to say, but I, I know you love well, it. Well, I want you to talk about his. So she spends all of this time building this this green garden on the roof of this city tenement building. And her goal is to get him to smile because through the whole book, he hasn't smiled. And so when he does come up, when he show when she shows him the um the garden that is her surprise to him so that i think that's such a great tool of the author is because when she gives him this gift that's when you expect him to smile he you expect him to just be beaming and for her to receive her reward of the smile that she's been seeking the whole time but it's the very same moment that he gives her a gift which is a cake adorned with all these mm-hmm. flowers and tells her the great news that she gets to go home and so and so in a real juxtaposition and a real opportunity for paradox the moment when we expect him to smile you know it, it, the picture to me he's in tears right because he's losing someone so special to him right and so look at his face he's so sad at the very moment that you want him to have the gift of a smile and joy but it's a different kind of happiness right it's a tear of happiness for her for sadness for him so Um, You know, it's such an interesting, I think, emotional juxtaposition there and a a really interesting thing for the author to have done there. So he's giving her the best news she could ever have. 
but for him, it's sad. It right? is. Even though yeah. he didn't ask for this, he didn't want this, but but they have a relationship that is special to both of them. And I love the, I love the, there's a cat, a black cat that lives in his house that is in almost every picture, maybe every picture of the book, almost every one. The cat isn't talked about. It just is there right. in every picture. And then in the final picture, when he's at the train station hugging her goodbye, the cat is in a little carrier. He's giving her the cat to take with her. I mean, it's just a beautiful story. And the, and the, the flowers are so symbolic of just beauty. I mean, she just yes. makes this, you know, this world that is clearly black and white when she arrives. She just makes it more and more beautiful. And it's interesting if you, if you in, the, in the exchanges, in the letters, at first, um, the, is it the grandmother sends her seeds and then she sends her bulbs and then she sends her um, like small plants. And so, you know, as the child is growing, and developing her community and making her environment more beautiful. And um, it, the seeds are representative of that growth too. What's coming to her, it started as a seed and now it's a plant and, you know, and a seedling. And so you can see just in that small detail, growth happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I think that that's just a lovely point about the story is just that, that, that the beauty is spreading. Um, yes. And throughout the community. That's right. That's right. So um, the other thing that I think is really interesting in, is it kind of reminds me of Miss Rumphius a little bit. She says, there are three important things. I'm not a very good baker, <laughs> right? But I love to garden. I'd like to learn to bake, um, but I need to know where to plant seeds, right? So you can see what her emphasis is, but she has, she's seeking opportunities. And then she says, I love my name, which is my grandmother's name. Was it her grandmother's name? I it think was so. Lydia Grace. It was her grandmother's yes. name? Yes, I yeah. think so. so that, she says, like my grandmother. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so I think, so that actually reminds me of the princess and the goblin, where the where the child has her grandmother's name. Right. And so, and that's one of the things that um, McDonald says about, um, you know, he says a name is a very special thing because it's something we can keep and also give away at the same time. And I think that's a really important concept. And that's kind of what's happening in this story is, you know, we can love something and, and, and the important things are things we keep and give away at the same time, beauty, love, hope, faith, a name, you know? And so I think that that's an interesting thing that, um, the author uses there is that a name is that the child has it and the grandmother has it and we can keep it and give it away all at the same time. I like that. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I hadn't I, thought about the name. Well, in, in the very ending illustration is just her and the grandmother again, walking off to do more gardening. I mean, it, the whole thing is cohesive. It all fits together. There's so many beautiful little little elements. It's one of those stories that even practically speaking introduces students to A, that, uh, that epistolary format, that, that, that letter writing where the letter carries the story, uh, but also just the sense of time because each one of those letters are weeks or months down the future. So students are getting this idea that stories happen over time. None of this is quick. None of this just happens. It's, it's faithful acts of planting over time while working in a depression. So there's so much good. In yeah, a book that like time this. element is important because yeah. it does take, it took her time to do this, but all of this time she's away from her family. And it really is a book about hardship, but finding joy and yeah. cheer in hardship and making the best of things, right. which we're all going, you know, we are all called to do. So, yeah, good start. The other one that surprised me that I really, at the beginning, wasn't wild about is Verdi. And I read it again now, and I feel like my whole feeling about that book has changed. But maybe I was just concerned because he doesn't want to grow So he's a snake that doesn't want to grow old because he doesn't want to be inactive. He doesn't want to just lie around like the old people, which I've become. (laughs) So maybe that is it, is that, you know, he doesn't want to use, lose his youth and he does all these funny things to try to. It's a Peter Pan-like It is a Peter Pan-like element, but then he hurts himself in one of his antics. And at that point, in order for him to heal, they tie him to a limb and he is forced to contemplate. And I think that is just, I just somehow missed the importance of that, that running around, not because I'm that running around person who is just constantly very task oriented. As long as I'm checking things off my list, I'm happy. But if I'm forced (laughs) to, 
to sit and to contemplate, then I'm going to recognize so many things that I totally missed. And there's a line in there that I love, and I don't know where it is, but I wrote it down because I loved it, where he's tied up and it says, time passed. The sun and moon took turns in the sky. Verdi marveled as the full moon grew thinner every night. Then he watched patiently as it slowly grew round again. He wondered why he hadn't noticed that before. It's the same thing that over time that, that he's learned to contemplate life and to, his life is, is, has become a more thoughtful one. And that doesn't replace youth or the activity of youth, but it certainly enriches a life that he wouldn't have if he continued to you know, be the bouncing off the walls kind of person that maybe it's just a personal lesson for me. Well, no, I think that that's, that's, <laughs> well, that's great. You know, to apply even that to yourself is one of the beauties of these, <laughs> of these read alouds. Yeah. Right. I, 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 um, that struck me as well because, um, you know, that is one of the purposes of reading is to make what is common miraculous. Right. I mean, right. that's what Lewis and Tolkien talk about mm-hmm. this all the time, you know, read, um, you know, the making of the Pegasus doesn't diminish the horse. It ennobles the horse. Right. And so uh, Charlotte's Web, you know, makes us recognize what a miracle a spider web is. Right. And Dale Alquist says this. Um, uh, he says, you know, of art, the point is to say, I've seen that a thousand times and I've never seen it right. before. Right. right. And so, you know, that that is when we can see things with a new perspective, when we can appreciate what is every day, when we can find what is miraculous in the things that we've seen a thousand times, right. you know, that that's part of the point of good literature. And so that that did that for you. It you did know? do <laughs> that for me. It did. It really did. And just that respect for elders that he had to come to, he didn't have respect for them, but he comes to a, a healthy respect for them. I, I just thought it was so much better than I originally found it to be. It's interesting how over the years they change, you know, it cha- your perspective changes. And so even a, something as small as a little picture book can change in importance to you. Well, I think that's one of the things that we want to communicate is so imperative about literature is it takes multiple times. It takes lots of readings. And even these books are worthy of that kind of reading. Oh, absolutely. And, and the other, just to have you know, a perspective that orients you toward the good things. I mean, it's a single sentence, right? right. I mean, you know, I, I, I dislike an approach to literature where it's just like, okay, where's the last page? You know, just a completion attitude towards right. a book d- doesn't orient you rightly toward good literature. It's the details. It's the pictures. It's an individual word. It's a very succinct description. I mean, those are the things that, you know, speak to your heart, but you have to, you have to train yourself to pay attention to them. And in these small books, it's the perfect way to orient the child that way because, um, you know, it, it, they're concise enough that you can do that. that you don't, right. you know, and it's and they're the pictures are beautiful and it's just a great introduction to, you know, a really sound approach to good literature. <laughs> <laughs>